Child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, discrimination. What is international business doing about these outrages? What can it do? And what should it do? And in our business in society point of view, our privacy, living with the genie out of the bottle. In this edition of Business in Society. Welcome to this edition of Business in Society. I'm John Palusek, host of the program. Tragically, millions of people around the world not only do not share in the many benefits of our globalized modern society, they are actually exploited within it. They are the unfortunates, children as well as adults, who are still enmeshed in circumstances that cry out for attention and for redress. In 2011, the United Nations generated such attention, and it was hoped action, when it published its far-reaching, quote, UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, unquote. On this edition of Business and Society, we report on the efforts made by socially responsible companies individually and in cooperation with concerned non-governmental organizations and governments in addressing these issues. For this report, we've invited leaders of two organizations that well before the UN Guiding Principles and subsequently have worked to improve the human rights of many people and communities in the globalized business supply chain. The Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility has, for more than 40 years, acted as a coalition of active share owners who view the management of their investments as a catalyst to promote justice and sustainability in the world. It comprises nearly 300 organizations, including faith communities, socially responsible investment management firms, universities, pension funds, and unions. The General Electric Company, GE, the renowned 130-year-old technology company with annual revenues of about $150 billion and some 300,000 employees worldwide, hardly needs an introduction. However, GE has also long been recognized for embedding sustainability into its culture and its business strategy. Its human rights policies for GE employees include non-discrimination, prohibitions against child and forced labor, freedom of association, and the right to engage in collective bargaining. Reverend David Schilling is the Senior Program Director at ICCR on Human Rights and Resources. Mark Nordstrom is Senior Labor and Employment Counsel at GE and leader of the company's human rights initiatives. Welcome, David and Mark. Glad to be here. Gentlemen, let's start by framing this discussion on human rights because the term human rights is quite broad. What are the major issues and challenges and, uh, and subject matter within that perimeter of the term human rights? How does ICCR come at it? How does GE come at that kind of prioritization of the agenda, as it were? Well, first, it's so critical uh, to be involved and engaged with communities uh, around the globe. At ICCR, it's faith-based uh, members have uh, partners all over the world. So first, it's important not to decide what the human rights issues and violations may be uh, in communities, but rather to be in touch with communities. Mm -hmm. And some of those are very clear. Uh, we've worked in the extractive industry, for example, as share owners in a range of mining companies, oil extractive companies, uh, lots of communities have said to us uh, through partnerships that when, for example, a mine might expand, uh, communities need to be engaged and involved with that process because it may mean displacing people. It may mean that the expansion might pollute the water. And it may mean health issues for uh, children in the so near it's, term. it's communities as well as individuals. That's right. It's individuals as well as communities. And I think the, when Professor John Ruggie went through the process at the UN uh, to, that ended up with the UN Guiding Principles, mm -hmm. he decided, and I think rightfully so, that the full range of human rights is what we're talking about. And that's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the economic, social, cultural rights, as well as the political, uh, it, it, sort of the freedom, the sort of impersonal freedom, 
freedom of association, et cetera. So we shouldn't decide, okay, which rights? I think it's the full range of rights. And certain sectors, you know, there's more impact in a community by, let's say, Newmont Mining in Peru than there is with H&M in Bangladesh, even though there are impacts that affect human rights. Yeah. How does it play out at GE, Mark? Well, you know, it's exactly as uh, David was saying. Uh, there are lots of human rights that are more salient to one business versus another. Um, so, for example, at GE, you might have a, an appliance business where supply chain is going to be a huge issue mm -hmm. and involve child labor, forced labor, those types of uh, rights that you would find in typical supply chain analysis. Um, an energy business where if you have a large infrastructure footprint, uh, you're going to be uh, uh, looking at rights around indigenous people, land use, environmental, and so forth. Uh, our healthcare business, uh, in some respects, is, uh, addresses a human right right there. Mm -hmm. But of course, one of the human rights that they would have to be cognizant of is privacy. Uh, likewise, we have a water business. Um, water is a human right, or access to water mm -hmm. is a human right. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the scope of GE businesses and its diversity, each one of the businesses needs to understand the full, uh, I, for simplicity purposes, we talk about the Declaration, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that has 30 rights articulated. You, you have to think of them all, but there's going to be a sweet spot of rights tied to the particular activities of a given business. And, and what has happened since the 2011 UN Guide and Principles? Has there, have there been initiatives? Has there been greater emphasis or, or perhaps even uh, identifiable progress that we can talk to? I think so. I, I, we can't underestimate the impact of having a kind of an emerging new global norm that helps define and guide, gives guidance to the role of business and human rights. I think our work as faith-based investors, SRI firms, in companies, we filed resolutions to get companies to adopt codes of conduct around human rights, whether it was for the supply chain or more of a comprehensive uh, human rights platform. But those were more uh, sort of company-specific, sometimes sector-specific. Now we have a global norm. I think the change then is, yes, you know, companies like GE, uh, others that uh, have been involved in the process are now into the implementation phase. So we're beginning to see that happen. And I think we, my, uh, my view is that the challenge now is to move beyond the few global companies that have really been a part of and endorsed and really are implementing the guiding principles to the mid small size enterprises mm -hmm. in all over the world. And we're having, there are initiatives doing that. The Global Business Initiative on Human Rights is really reaching uh, companies in emerging markets that haven't been a part of the global discussion. So I think the, the, it's, it has a tremendous potential, hasn't been realized yet, but a tremendous potential to give guidance to a very small company who may not face all of the challenges of a large global company, but has responsibilities. It's the corporate responsibility to respect human rights that's now the norm as opposed to, well, states, that state obligation. Mm -hmm. It sounds as if that is indeed what's been happening mm -hmm. increasingly. I think actually for uh, many countries, certain companies, certainly GE, it started before that. Once John was appointed as special uh, representative for business and human rights, he didn't waste any time. So in 2006, we first met John when we joined an organization called BLEAR, the Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights. And we as a U.S. company, not particularly well-schooled in human rights at the time, uh, thought it wise, based on input from uh, organizations, stakeholders like ICCR, to kind of get up to speed quickly. And the way to do that for us was to join this organization. Mm -hmm. Where in Boston, I met John early in 2006, and that's when we began to focus primarily on human rights. And, we, and there was a reason for it, and the reason was um, we were going to be expanding in emerging markets where human rights are under pressure. And rather than simply go to these emerging markets and run into problems that we hadn't really thought about, 
we felt it was important to tr try to get some early teachings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emerging markets, however, that, that, that leads to an interesting area as well because it goes to the business case for being responsible in this respect. And obviously ICCR has um, investors as a very central constituency. That's correct. And GE speaks of creating additional shareholder value uh, in, in, in this connection as well. So there is kind of a common denominator uh, in terms of the importance of the investor in this, uh, in this uh, commitment, et cetera. I, how, does, how does creating additional shareholder value fit into this discussion? Well, socially responsible investors like, like uh, David's organization are certainly one of the shareholder value equations or inputs that you want to be uh, cognizant of. Yeah. But, but I think more, more broadly than that, um, what, we're, what we're trying to do at GE is make money, uh, make it ethically, and make a difference. And many of the products that we have, we think, uh, respond to the issues uh, of individuals and people at the bottom of the pyramid uh, in some of these emerging markets. So our products, as I mentioned, water, energy, healthcare, particularly uh, respond to those issues. If we want to produce and sell products in uh, companies that uh, are in the emerging markets, we have to do it in a way that doesn't you know, put our reputation on the line. So we want to sell those products, we want to sell them in the emerging markets, and we want to do it in a way that keeps GE um, known throughout the world as an ethical, responsible citizen. And then there's the echo imagination commitment as well. That, Correct. That is the backdrop, perhaps. I think um, it, we're up to about $25 billion worth of, of products that are part of the eco-imagination equation. Mm -hmm. And these are products that uh, can be used worldwide in a way that's more sustainable than products of the past. And so um, Jeff always likes to say, uh, green is green. And we've never made any bones about the fact that we believe that making products that are green will ultimately, in the long run, prove to be a good uh, value for the shareholder. But David, your constituency seems to be centrally uh, placed in the socially responsible investing community. Mm -hmm. Is the socially responsible investment community growing? And uh, are you, in, in a sense, benefiting from the kind of commitments you're getting from those people? Yes, it's growing, and I think we're benefiting as well. But I think if you look at sort of assets under management that are socially responsible. In the, in the 80s, it was probably about 80 billion. Uh, now it's close to 4 trillion. And that's calculated through a variety of uh, screens as well as active engagement uh, uh, of companies. But I think no question that that's, that's building. And I think part of it is uh, mainstream investors are now seeing uh, investment in companies and other products uh, through a, a lens of environmental, social governance issues. The ESG has really been elevated, and the UN Principles on Responsible Investment is now a group of uh, members. Some of our members are members of the UNPRI, but it's bringing in some of the mainstream, you know, larger pension funds, uh, asset management firms, to begin for the first time to look at human rights criteria for their investments. And I think, you know, that helps. And, and you're it, using a couple of different screens, aren't they? Positive and negative screens? That's in, right. In that regard? That's right. How does that play out? Well, I mean, a negative screen, it depends on the institution. Uh, ICCR doesn't sort of dictate that to uh, our members. They have their own screens. But the, a negative screen would really be looking at a sector. It may be, for some, oil and gas. Uh, it may be tobacco. It may be, uh, you know, weapons. It may be a whole range of things. It may be companies that have, over time, had really a, a, a negative record on the environment yeah. or on human rights or child labor. Yeah. So the negative is really not putting your money in. The positive is, okay, here are companies that are taking leadership, and we want to reward that. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think there's, there's that drive to encourage companies to 
take into account human rights, social sustainability, environmental sustainability mm -hmm. issues as a part of their core business, not as an add-on that is you know, good in terms of maybe volunteerism or philanthropy. It's really at the core of the business. Yeah. And I think that's the exciting yeah. piece. And I think now there's an opportunity for sort of mobilizing more of the traditional uh, funds mm -hmm to weigh in on the side of, well, human rights, okay, it may start as it's good risk management, but then you begin to see it's not just risk, it's the opportunity to build more sustainable communities where the consumer base grows, uh, et cetera. And that's so the mainstream investor is getting much more interested in this. Yes. Not Mark, there Mark, yet, but more interesting. Mark, are you seeing something like that at GE as well? And also with your employees, perhaps, and your customers, that kind of sentiment in terms of uh, approaching the relationship with GE? Yeah, I think it used to be that uh, civil society was kind of in the uh, name and shame mode. Mm. And I think back in, you know, 2000, early 2000, mid 2000, there's been a greater uh, level of dialogue and collaboration between pointing out, educating corporations about some of the sensitivities that just weren't there. Mm -hmm. And corporations were listening and are still listening. Uh, we've got a long way to go. I'm not saying that uh, things are perfect, but, but I think the alignment of civil society and corporations uh, has really uh, taken off. And it's needed, too, because uh, certainly uh, some governments are more protective of human rights than others. And where we are going uh, throughout the world, w we may not have governments that are quite as protective. And so having the allegiance, having the, the, um, the working together collaboration of civil society and corporations is a huge benefit in terms of the direction uh, we're going in the human rights and business game. And I think, Mark, one good example of that, recent example, which I think you have really addressed in other programs, is the Bangladesh yes. situation where fire, fire issues, killing workers, uh, collapsed building. Now you have a, an accord that has well over 80 companies working with trade unions, civil society, and really putting together an inspection plan total transparency of what's taking place and the opportunities not just to deal with fire safety and health but other human rights issues in terms of wages, working conditions, to restructure in, in effect to make the apparel industry in, in Bangladesh much more uh, in line with human rights criteria. And does this work in other issues as well? Child labor, trafficking? Oh, uh, human trafficking a, is a great example. Please, yes. No, I, you know, human trafficking is a, is a huge issue globally. Um, and and the, one of the problems with, just like human rights, uh, it's a term that is br broad and difficult to define because it can be everything from migrant workers to child labor to sex traffic. You know, so it covers a lot of turf. Um, which is a little bit of a problem. However, the needs are so great, and uh, I think that e even our own government, in terms of the executive order uh, for uh, uh, federal, federal um, uh, contractors to have you know, a policy and practices that address human tra trafficking is illustrative of the fact that you know, people are, uh, throughout the world, understanding this is something that we have to come together to resolve. The question of the, uh, the terrible unemployment rates, especially in less developed countries and most especially in terms of the younger generation, is, is that within the periphery of the human rights discussion? Well, I think it has to be. I, I, you know, no matter where you are in this world, uh, the U.S. Or, or, or anywhere else, job creation, education, and uh, health care for, uh, for the youth, all of those things are very, very important. And um, I, we've all got to do our part because the problem is only worsening and uh, it's not going to be one that's solved by any single corporation or any government or any you know, element of civil society. It really requires us all to be coming together. Uh, and uh, you know, there are some, some basic elements, I think, of uh, infrastructure that's necessary for, like energy, for, you know, for uh, job creation to occur, whether it's in uh, Ni Nigeria or 
in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And so some of these products that, that GE has and that other corporations have are necessary in order for job creation and giving the youth education and jobs. And I think this, uh, it's a critical point to look at if you're dealing with human rights issues directly, uh, for example, a broad coalition of uh, faith-based organizations, human rights groups, uh, trade associations working to change forced child labor by the government of Uzbekistan in the cotton fields. Mm -hmm. So for four years, we've had a broad coalition, government, uh, you know, state, uh, we look at you know, trade unions, labor, investors, et cetera. And the, if, you, if we're successful there, working through the International Labor Organization, having 120 companies say they're not going to knowingly source from uh, Uzbekistan, you're actually helping to create jobs. Yeah. Because right now, it's children who schools are closed, go to the fields, not being paid. Those are jobs that should be well paid, and uh, adults should be doing them. So I think there's an interrelationship of creating a framework as we look at specific issues like forced child labor, which is an egregious violation, and making it possible for you know, fair wages to be paid in an industry if it can restructure itself with the help of the international community. We only have a few more moments, but David, um, it's not just filing proxy resolutions. Sometimes it's meeting with uh, companies, and sometimes there's a long time process in terms of getting some action. Uh, how does that play out? The shareholder resolution is an important sort of getting the door open. Uh, the votes are important because the share, other shareholders know what the issues are and can vote, uh, but it's only one avenue. I mean, more and more, we are meeting with companies, uh, engaging with top management without the need for a shareholder resolution. Why? Because the door is open. Mm -hmm. And there's, is, if emerging issues are um, there, whether it's trafficking and slavery or issues around food, um, around water, the human right to water, there may be a need. But often, yeah. when it's open, if yeah. you're dealing with the right people in the companies and you sort of look at it from here we are now let's take this awareness of the issue let's move to action goals uh, put in place policies yeah. that'll address this to not only protect the rights of people but protect the company as well just just to cap off this discussion because we are running out of time mark what do you think is the is the future um, the velocity and, and the direction of CSR and sustainability among corporations these days and on into the future? Well, the, I, I think, you know, the tipping point is past, okay, and particularly as you mentioned with John Ruggie's report. Uh, what we need to do is get this seep down uh, mm -hmm. to smaller, uh, you know, mid-sized uh, corporations. I mean, we have the this, the girth, if you will, to devote time and effort on this, but uh, there are other uh, organizations, other business entities that do not have the type of, um, you know, uh, backbone and, 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 and resources to really focus in on this. So somehow we have to uh, make this digestible and implementable, if you will, uh, at a level within all of the corporations throughout the globe, and that's a huge task. A huge task. Thank you so much for coming, David Great and Mark. You. Thank you. Really Thank you. very, very interesting. We'll be back in a moment. In our business in society point of view, our privacy, living with the genie out of the bottle. The current invasion of our personal privacy by government, cyber hackers, and yes, business, sometimes tempts you to think, just get over it. C'est la vie, move on. The privacy genie is out of the bottle. But that's neither smart nor good citizenship. And in some instances, with unwarranted government intrusion, it can even be dangerous. Moreover, privacy is precious. Justice Louis Brandeis defined the right to be left alone as, quote, the most comprehensive of rights and the right most valued by civilized men, unquote. However, the privacy invaders now seem to be ubiquitous, from the cookies on our computers to the black boxes in our cars. 
and from government monitoring of our emails, phone calls, or even the mail handled by the U.S. Post Office, it's pretty hard to remain totally private. Not to mention the security cameras on our streets and tracking cameras in retail stores. And try to opt out of a system that, whether you know it or not, or approve it or not, is gathering and sharing gobs of personal information. But let's face it, many of us have been complicit. We often leave ourselves open to tracking, whether by the government for national security or industry, mainly for marketing. We disclose private information in obtaining government services or market services. So what's to be done? Write to your congressman seems a bit facile, but there are specific new policies that government should establish. Declassifying more information is one. A more vigorous U.S. Civil Liberties Oversight Board is another. True, according to the Pew Center, a majority of Americans think it acceptable for the National Security Agency to track Americans' phone activity in order to investigate terrorism, but carefully considered additional transparency of some of these programs would surely be comforting. That won't happen without broad public support. On the business tracking front, an increasing number of private internet users are hiring cybersecurity firms to help them guard against identity incursions. Or if they're sophisticated enough, they're strengthening their passwords, considering encryption, and more frequently using cash rather than credit cards. Two, some makers of web browsers and app suppliers are sensitive to consumer demand for more privacy, and they're reportedly building more protection into their software. But the ad networks that use such tracking systems for precise audience targeting always seem to be one step ahead of the privacy protection systems. This kind of privacy tug of war with the citizen consumer in the middle would best be alleviated by business itself. The alternative? Well, here's how the New York Times recently put it. Quote, Voluntary industry standards, if they can be achieved, are a good start, but the best way to ensure privacy is strong federal legislation backed by tough enforcement, unquote. So, as citizen consumers, each of us has a choice. C'est la vie, or making it clear to government and business alike that what we can live with are some privacy intrusions, if they are transparent and justified, but there are distinct limits to our forbearance. And in deciding to act, let's keep in mind what our old friend from France, Alex de Tocqueville, reportedly told us about 175 years ago. He said, quote, in a democracy, the people get the government they deserve. And we might add, and the society they deserve. And that's the business and society point of view. Join us again for the next edition of Business in Society. For more information, please visit businessandsociety.net.